This is my third video on the alleged Moscow killer Brian Koberger. If you haven't seen my previous two episodes, make sure you check them out. They're well worth watching. In this episode, we're going to discuss the sheath, the knife, the arrest affidavit, newly discovered Papa Rogers online activity. I do believe Papa Roger is Brian Koberger on Facebook. We're going to talk about how long the crime took, the route taken, and how the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, usually. <laughs> Dylan's received a lot of online abuse in this case, and we're going to talk about Dylan. Stay tuned for that. Now let's jump right into this video and see what I have to say for myself for this third time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Crime Circus. My name is Drip Drop, and I'm your host as always. This is my third episode on Brian Koberger. All names, people, places, and events mentioned in this video is purely speculation, guessing, and theorizing. Nothing is presented as fact or evidence. Brian Koberger is presumed innocent. However, we're going to jump right into this and start with a boom. For those of you that aren't familiar, Elliot Roger is somewhat of a hero in the incel world, and he stabbed three of his roommates to passing away. And then he went on a shooting spree and made three more people pass away. Brian Koberger had an infatuation with killers, and he was somewhat obsessed with his idol, Elliot Roger, which is why he called his online Facebook handle Papa Roger. Let's jump right into this and see what Papa Roger had to say for himself. This post on Facebook from Papa Roger on November 30th says, Of the evidence released, the murder weapon has been consistent as a large fixed blade knife. This leads me to believe they found the sheath. This evidence was released prior to autopsies. The discussion on that post continues, and we're going to read about it. And as many of you are aware of the moment, the sheath is the number one key piece of evidence linking Brian Koberger to the crime scene. The sheath of a knife, which is a leather pouch holder that a knife slides into for protection, was left next to Maddie on Maddie's bed. They found Brian's DNA on the knife sheath. As far as I know, Papa Roger was the first one on the internet to become obsessed with the sheath theory. And we're going to continue down this path. Let's read further into this thread. Somebody named Dustin says, Fixed blade means that it's not a folding knife. The way I'm guessing they could tell was by impressions or bruising around the stab wounds that showed the outline of a guard on the knife. Papa Roger says, Dustin, you wouldn't be able to tell that at the crime scene. Dustin responds, I disagree. If the stabbing motions were hard, the guard would have left a mark. Papa Roger says, Dustin, they don't clean bodies at a crime scene. The amount of blood must have been tremendous. Dustin says, due to the number of victims and assuming each victim was stabbed multiple times, I'm sure that there was visible evidence of a guard. For all we know, the investigators on the scene wiped a couple stab wounds clean to look for bruising. I think it's far more logical than finding a sheath. Sheaths are usually attached to a belt. Papa Roger says, Dustin, but the police were very specific about the type of knife used. Scott Jute reportedly told them his shop doesn't sell the specific knife. Papa Roger says, Dustin, they are looking for a very specific knife. He continues, Dustin, curious, why are you debating the sheath theory so hard? Dustin says, because who would carry a sheath? Dustin seems like a very intelligent man. Who would carry a sheath to a crime? Let's continue this thread. Papa Roger says, Dustin, who would carry a large knife exposed? Dustin responds, sheaths are meant for belts. As you can see here, Dustin is being very logical. Papa Roger is really arguing this point hard. And clearly Brian didn't want to carry a large exposed sharp knife because he was afraid of injuring himself in typical incel fashion. Moving on. Papa Roger asks, Dustin, how did the killer hold the knife prior to entering the scene in your opinion? Dustin says, how in the hell would I know that? I'm sorry that nobody is buying this sheath theory of yours. Papa Roger asks, Dustin, do you carry a knife? Dustin says, Papa Roger, dude, give it a rest. You sound like a psycho. As you can see here, Papa Roger really does sound like a psycho. I haven't found anyone else on the entire internet that was so obsessed in pushing this sheath theory. This was long before we had ever even heard about the white Elantra or the arrest affidavit for probable cause. Continuing, Papa Roger says, Dustin, remember, I made the original post and you have gone down this path. 
So similar to inside looking on Reddit, this seems to be some type of sick, advanced college study that Brian Koberger has conducted. He really does like to ask questions. Really creepy, sick questions. Continuing. Dustin says, Papa Roger, so since I commented on your post with my opinion on a discussion board, I should be accepting of your weird and creepy ass questions? Papa Roger says, asking if you carry a knife is weird and creepy? Dustin says, Papa Roger, asking me questions like which hand did he hold the knife in? And do you carry a knife with no context is strange. You were asking me questions that only the killer would know answers to. Are you suggesting that I'm the killer? Papa Roger says, Dustin, I'm only responding to you. Why would you even bring up the killer thought? Odd. Dustin says, Sorry I trashed your stupid sheet theory and you couldn't take it. Any other brain buster theories? Maybe they found a receipt laying in the kitchen for the knife. Papa Roger says, Why are you angry? Dustin says, Papa Roger, why do you communicate like a serial killer? As you can see here, Papa Roger does communicate like a killer. Every single person that communicated with Papa Roger or inside looking became very alarmed with who they were communicating with. People that can't function that well in the real world sometimes reveal themselves on the internet because they just don't have the proper social skills to blend in. That wasn't the entire Facebook discussion and some messages were lost in the mix, unfortunately. However, you can see the red flags that were raised and people that saw those posts in real time were concerned. This was long before any arrest of Brian Koberger. People were concerned about Papa Roger and inside looking. Let's see what else Papa Roger had to say for himself on Facebook that raised some red alarms. Within 24 hours of the police putting out a be on the lookout for a white Hyundai Elantra, Papa Roger posted, I feel like the white car isn't relevant. Of course, within 24 hours of the news release about the white Elantra, Papa Roger, aka Brian Koberger, would feel like the white car isn't relevant. He spent a lot of time on the internet trying to misdirect people. Let's see what he had to say for himself one week after the car was reported. Papa Roger says the white car is a red herring. For those of you that don't know a red herring, that means misdirection, a false clue, something we shouldn't be looking at. Also in both of those posts, Papa Roger referred to it as a white car or the white car. Well, we were looking for specifically a white Hyundai Elantra. He made sure not to mention Hyundai Elantra and people were actually sending me tips of Honda Civics, Toyota Camrys and all kinds of other white cars. The police knew they were looking for a white Hyundai Elantra. Papa Roger wanted to make that a little cloudy and make it look like they were looking for any white car and that it was just a false clue anyways. Brian Koberger, aka Papa Roger, left a little breadcrumbs that led directly back to him. Now let's move on to the next topic. Right here I'm going to show you some images of what was most likely the knife used, not the actual knife, but images of the same type of knife. This type of knife cost about $90 at any sporting goods store and a knife sheath is typically meant to put on a belt. Brian wasn't smart enough to put it on his belt, so apparently he had it in his hand because he didn't want to cut himself. Apparently he actually entered the residence with the knife sheath on the knife, and he didn't pull the knife out of the knife sheath until he was inside of Maddie's bedroom. Maddie and Xana were the targets here. Papa Roger says on December 14th, not a new post from me, but still very relevant. How long was the killer in the house? Somebody asked Papa Roger, how long do you think? Papa Roger responds, 15 minutes. Is anybody else alarmed by that? Papa Roger said 15 minutes. Papa Roger's car was seen arriving at 4.04 a.m. and seen leaving at 4.20 a.m. That's 16 minutes. When you account for the time of parking and walking into the house, walking out of the house and leaving, looks like Papa Roger was dead on. The crime took about 15 minutes. Is there any doubt by anybody out there at this point that Papa Roger is the killer? At this point, we have no way to know for sure. We can only speculate and guess. However, these clues are all adding together and this speculation is all making so much sense. So, so far we have Papa Roger being correct about the knife sheath. We have him being correct down to nearly the minute for how long the crime took. We have him trying to say that the white car has nothing to do with this case. 
and we also have a previous post seen in my last video about him having ED, which is why there was no SA. It all makes sense, folks. Now moving on. Another post that Papa Roger posted on Facebook. Let's read it. The date of killing was chosen on purpose. Thoughts. I touched on this in my previous video. Numerology. Brian Koberger is obsessed with numerology. The house was chosen because of its address. The date was chosen because of the date. The Amityville horror happened on November 13th, and some other horrible things have also happened on the 13th of various months. So of course the date was chosen on purpose, just like Papa Roger is asking. To him, this is some type of sick advanced study. He's studying all of us as we're studying him. Many people were on to him. He wasn't as smart as he thought he was. He may have been book smart, but in the real world, all of us seem so much smarter. Papa Roger says on Facebook on December 2nd, this is the high side of the house. They found evidence here. It is likely blood dripping from the killers. Either way, they fled through the area or they were parked there. This being the most strategic entrance point to the house, it shows planning. It certainly does show planning, and I believe Brian Koberger was very proud of himself for the amount of planning that he did in this case. I do believe his cell phone pinged in the area at least 12 times prior to that horrible fateful night. Also on Reddit, the user Inside Looking had previously posted a zoomed in photo of a footprint right next to a police officer that was found right on that very hill. They were all telling us all along that's exactly how the killer came and went. With each and every single post, I believe Brian Koberger was reliving the experience. He was proud of himself, and he wanted notoriety, and we'll talk about that soon. Speaking of planning, this is the route that the arrest affidavit lays out that Brian took from Pullman, Washington to Moscow, Idaho. He took the long way. If he had just taken Route 270, it would have only been about a 10 minute drive. However, he took about an hour drive there and about an hour drive back, which is why the crime didn't happen at exactly 3 a.m., but he did leave his house shortly before 3 a.m. So the plan was set in motion around 3 a.m. Just like I've said previously in other videos, same thing with the Amityville Horror, it didn't happen at exactly 3 a.m. That's always an approximate guess because it's impossible to know exactly when these horrible crimes happen. Let's take a look comparing some photos of Ted Bundy to Brian Koberger. And for those of you that don't know, Brian Koberger's mom apparently liked Ted Bundy. That's not a fact, that's me guessing based off of an article that was posted in the newspaper by Brian's mother. As you can see here, both of these guys look like pure narcissist psychopaths. They have such similar strange looks to their face. They have that look in their eyes like there's really no soul inside of the human body. Honestly, it's chilling and these guys will probably give me nightmares tonight after I make this video. I have a couple more topics I'd like to discuss in this video and then we're gonna wrap it up. Does the apple fall far from the tree? Usually the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Father like son, son like father. I'm not saying Brian's daddy is a killer. I'm not saying Brian's mommy is a killer. But Brian's sister was in a horror movie. A teen slasher flick. I think it was called Two Days Back. It looks like it had a budget of about $10. None of us should probably watch that movie. It was probably garbage. But it is quite interesting that his sister was inside of a horror movie with the slashing happening. And now Brian is accused of committing a real life horror movie. Brian's mother wrote the article to the newspaper about Ted Bundy. Brian's father flew all the way across the country to have an extremely long road trip back to Pennsylvania. Also, they weren't taking the short route. Let's take a look at these maps. If you are planning on driving cross country from Washington to Pennsylvania, it's about a 37 hour drive. However, they didn't take a direct route. For some reason, they went all the way down to Colorado as it was written inside of the arrest affidavit. From Colorado, they went all the way to Indianapolis, Indiana. And from there, they went to Pennsylvania. As you can see on this image right here, that adds approximately 500 miles to the trip, which is about eight extra hours. And if you include bathroom breaks, gas breaks, and stopping for food, that's an additional 10 hours. Who in the world would add an additional 10 hours to a cross country road trip? That doesn't make any sense. What were they doing in Colorado? And what were they doing passing through Indianapolis? And that's most likely why they were stopped twice in Indianapolis by the police, because even the FBI was sketched out wondering where they were going. It certainly looked like they were fleeing and it really didn't look like they were going to Pennsylvania. These are serious, important questions and this is a super serious case for the victims and families in this horrible tragedy. 
the cross-country trip doesn't make any sense to go to Colorado. It would make sense if they were spending a couple days in Colorado, but that's not the case. It sounds like they just drove through Colorado, the license plate was captured on the license plate reader, and they continued on their journey. So why were they heading south in the first place? Was Brian fleeing to Mexico, and then they had a change of mind after having a talk in the car after driving for many hours? Did they weigh their options and decide, we'll just head back to Pennsylvania and wait it out? I think that's a good possibility. What do you think? This is just me speculating and I'm allowed to do that. We're all allowed to ask questions in this case. Now, the final topic I want to discuss in this video is Dylan. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. Everybody wants to hear about Dylan. I'm one of the only true crime channels that hasn't discussed Dylan yet. And now we're going to. A lot of people have said hurtful, hateful, harmful things against Dylan. True cyberbullying. A lot of things have been said about her that aren't nice. Let's start with number one. Some people have said she's trans. That's not nice to say to a naturally born female. To even speculate about a teenager's gender is awful. Even if she was trans, why would you speculate about somebody else's sex? That's not nice. I fully believe 100% Dylan is a naturally born woman. She's tall, she's beautiful, she appears to have lip injections. It looks like all her friends liked her. Other than that, nobody knows anything about Dylan. I have no reason to believe that she was involved in this crime in any way whatsoever. Certain people out there have even dragged her boyfriend into this horror story. Her boyfriend's never even been to Moscow, Idaho. He lives in Boise, which is about five hours away. Dylan is a surviving victim in this case, and people want to know, did she know Brian? Did she have anything to do with this crime? No. There's been no evidence she knows Brian, and there's no evidence she did anything in this case. In the arrest affidavit, it basically says she had come face to face with Brian shortly after he had made Ethan and Xana pass away. She opened her door, and she saw him. And he certainly saw her as well. I'm going to put this image on the screen, and this is a representation of what she might have seen that evening. As you can see looking at this photo here, this is what it may have looked like from Dylan's view. Brian, dressed in all black, wearing a black mask just like his parents and sister have recently been seen wearing, all black in a black mask. I guess that's just something the Kobergers do. They all dress all the same, all in black, just like the Adams family. Anyways, some people have speculated, well, maybe Brian didn't see Dylan. It is 100% impossible that Brian did not see Dylan. If you look at this image right here, you can see that walking from the living room to the kitchen, it's impossible not to see Dylan in her doorway. Even if the door was cracked, he would have been able to see her. And there's been no discussion that the door was cracked. She most likely opened the door all the way to see what the heck was happening in the house she was living in. She said she stood there frozen in fear. That's much more likely if the door was all the way open as opposed to cracked. If the door was just cracked, you wouldn't really stand there frozen in fear. You'd probably run for the closet while you still could. I firmly believe that there was only two targets in the home that night, Zana and Maddie, who both worked at Mad Greek, a restaurant downtown in Moscow. There's no reason that the killer would have thought Kaylee or Ethan would have been there that night. He had been scoping out the house. Kaylee no longer lived in that house. Ethan lived in a frat house. Most likely other times when Brian was scoping out the house, he never saw Kaylee or Ethan, and the house looked like a much easier target to him. Now back to Dylan. Brian had already made his two targets pass away. He didn't know Dylan, he had never seen Dylan, he had nothing against Dylan. There was no reason to do a fifth passing away. And Brian wanted notoriety. He left one to tell the tale. This is in a lot of movies, it's in a lot of books, it's happened a lot in real life. Many times, a sick, sick man has left one person alive to tell the tale. In fact, that's been happening since the beginning of a time. It's in many history books. Many times, one person is left alive. And I believe that's what happened to Dylan. Brian did see Dylan, and he was okay with that. He wasn't there to hurt Dylan. He wanted Dylan to survive. They found Brian's footprint directly outside of Dylan's door. Dylan's door would have been the first door he encountered entering that house. And he passed it. He passed Dylan's room at least three times while he was in that house. First when he entered, second when he came back from upstairs, and third when he was leaving. If he wanted to hurt Dylan, he would have. That doesn't make Dylan his accomplice or have anything to do with this. Dylan's lucky to be alive. This is a diagram that somebody sent me off the internet. 
As you can see here, the purple line is where Brian most likely first went. He went into the house, past Dylan's room, went upstairs, did those horrible things to Maddie and Kaylee, went back down the stairs, as you can see with the orange line, went to Xana and Ethan's bedroom, did those horrible things to those people. And then the green line is Brian leaving as he passed Dylan one additional time and Dylan stood face to face frozen in fear as he just walked out the house. And yes, that's the knife sheath on the left and that's exactly what was found on Maddie's bed. Also, a lot of people are wondering why didn't Dylan call 911? Dylan didn't know she had to call 911. She's a teenager. She didn't know any crimes had just happened. She was living in a party house. She was used to seeing strange men coming and going all the time. She had only been living there for a couple months and surely she had already seen some weird things. As some of us saw on the body camera video, a man walked out of that house wearing zip ties around his wrist. Surely there were some strange happenings in that household that Dylan had seen. The other girls had been living there for a while, Dylan was brand new. If you're brand new and you're just being accepted into this new group of people, you don't call the cops on them no matter what kind of weird stuff they're into or that could result in some really bad hazing and you could even get kicked out of the house. She was scared frozen stiff. She didn't know what to think of it. There's a possibility she has past trauma and her brain couldn't function properly in that moment. It's also been theorized maybe she was under the influence of alcohol something of the sort that's a possibility that she could have felt like she was on a bad trip we just don't know unless you're in those shoes you don't know how you'd react you don't know what it's like to be a survivor some of you might but i think the majority of the audience out there making allegations and speculations really has no idea what that would have been like this is a teenage girl without a lot of life experience who probably has past trauma and may have been under the influence of something and that's just what it is she wanted to sleep it off and hope it was just a nightmare, and she probably felt like she was in a nightmare. So she went to bed. I don't think she should be blamed for that or judged for that. She's not the killer. She's not the one that did these actions. Brian Koberger allegedly is the one that did this solo, without any help from anybody. I'd like to think this case has been a real learning experience for many people of the world, online and off, whether you're on Reddit, Facebook, watching short TikTok videos, or even watching videos on YouTube such as Crime Circus. Nothing you watch should be taken as fact. Everything must be taken with a grain of salt because you just never know what's real. Anyways, a final little bit of information I'd like to discuss. Brian did return to the house the same morning of the passing aways of these four beautiful, innocent individuals. A little bit after 9 a.m., his cell phone pinged in the area. He certainly was returning to the scene of the crime. Some people think he went back to go look for the sheath. I don't think that's true. It's a known fact that these evil monsters like to return to the scene of their crimes to witness the aftermath, the horror, the destruction, the community in distress. He was expecting to see police officers, ambulances, fire trucks, and everything. To his dismay and confusion, he saw nothing. The house was quiet, the neighborhood is quiet. He drove around for a few minutes and he left certainly confused. He knew that Dylan had seen him. He wasn't returning inside the house. He left. News reporters showed up hours later after the crime was reported and it became a big deal. And in the background of one of those news reports, you can see a white Hyundai Elantra on the road behind King Road. And that was most likely Brian returning to the scene once again to check out what was happening. That time, he probably didn't bring the same cell phone that he had with him previously that the police were tracking. Brian Koberger appears to be a sick, sick individual, allegedly. Thank you for watching this Brian Koberger series. There's three episodes so far. If you haven't seen the others, make sure you check them out. If you like what I'm doing, please smash the thumbs up button. If you want to support this show with a little extra, please consider checking out my Patreon membership or my YouTube membership. Any and all help that I get is really appreciated. I'm releasing some stuff behind the scenes and I've got a podcast coming out for members only. I'd love to hear your thoughts and theories on this case. Let me know if you think I got any of this wrong. I'm not always right. This is just guessing. None of us know the whole 100% truth at the moment. And until next time, remember to stay safe out there because you know it's a dangerous world.